In recent history, diabetes has turned into an epidemic. In addition, the common understanding regarding its cure, based on a medical perspective, is that it can only be cured with the assistance of surgery or other complicated methods. The problem with this view is that it does not take nutritional changes into account and only presents expensive, risky, and complicated methods to cure type 2 diabetes. The main point of the Diabetes Code is that since overconsumption of carbohydrates is a chronic manner that leads to an insulin response in our bodies that causes diabetes, the most effective and fruitful way to reverse the disease is to lessen carbohydrate consumption. A huge number of clinical trials, amongst other things, have proven the role of a low-carbohydrate diet in obesity reduction. The Diabetes Code Start Guide First Fact We can completely reverse and prevent type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a dietary illness and can be reversed completely with the assistance of changes in diet and lifestyle. Medications are not the way. Second Fact Sugar in excess quantities causes type 2 diabetes. We need to lessen our consumption of sugar and carbohydrates to reduce our levels of insulin. With insulin, blood glucose improves but diabetes deteriorates. Medications worsen diabetes by stuffing blood glucose into cells that are already enlarged. Third fact, type 2 diabetes leaves an effect on each organ in the body. With blood glucose increasing over a long period of time, each body cell begins to decay, which negatively affects all organs in the body. Fourth fact, type 2 diabetes can be reversed and prevented in the absence of any medication, with the assistance of diet changes. We just need to keep the sugar away by consuming less and less and burning the amount left. According to the author, to reduce sugar consumption, stay away from added sugar and refined carbohydrates. Also, the best way to burn off sugar is fasting. Since 1980, the number of people experiencing diabetes has multiplied four times. Diabetes mellitus has been around for thousands of years. In ancient times, this disease was linked with honey urine. The disease was usually fatal back then. The Greek physician Apollonius named the disease diabetes by 250 BC. This only refers to too much urination. In 1675, Thomas Willis annexed the term mellitus, meaning from honey. A disease called diabetes insipidus also exists, but it stems from traumatic brain injury. In this book, the term diabetes only alludes to diabetes mellitus. After offering the history of diabetes, the author shifted to the origins of the epidemic. Also, healthy Americans started experiencing heart attacks in increasing numbers in the 1950s. Dietary fat became the alleged culprit. People started believing that dietary fat increases blood cholesterol levels, which contributes to heart disease. Physicians began recommending low-fat diets, which increased high-carbohydrate diets, since both lead to a sense of fullness. The government recommended a diet with lots of carbohydrates and fewer fats. Contrary to what was believed then, total fats are not connected to cardiovascular disease. Several high-fat foods are good for our hearts, including nuts, olive oil, avocados, etc. Recent dietary guidelines in the U.S. in 2016 removed the limitations on total fats. In recent times, the connection between naturally occurring fats and cardiovascular illnesses has also been proven to be untrue. Trans fats are bad, but fats in meat and dairy products are not. The result of the 1980 guidelines, the low-fats and high-carbohydrate diets, led to the obesity epidemic. Recommended foods such as potatoes, pastas, and breads just contributed to obesity. These foods contribute to the biggest increase in blood insulin and glucose. The introduction of the above-food pyramid multiplied obesity at once, and diabetes a decade later. In 1980, almost 108 million people had diabetes globally. By 2014, the number had reached 422 million. Current numbers in the U.S. of those with diabetes and pre-diabetes are alarming. The dynamic between type 1 and type 2 diabetes has also shifted. 
While type 1 diabetes was more common earlier, in 2016 it contributed to not even 10% of the diabetes cases. It was usually deadly, but comparatively less prevalent. Approximately all diabetes patients today are obese and likely to experience complexities pertaining to their condition. Even though insulin and other contemporary medicines can treat blood glucose, lessening blood glucose is not sufficient to prevent complications such as cancer, heart disease, stroke, etc., which can ultimately cause death. A question arises as to why we haven't been able to treat type 2 diabetes efficiently when we have regulated so many other diseases. The answer is that we have misconstrued the disease. Diabetes mellitus, linked with high blood glucose, has four types. Type 1, type 2, gestational diabetes, associated with pregnancy, and other particular types. Type 2 diabetes is the most prevalent. 90% of diabetes cases are type 2. Gestational diabetes is not chronic, even though it adds to future risk of type 2 diabetes. If hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, stays after pregnancy, it will need to be classified into type 1, type 2, or another specific type of diabetes. Hyperglycemia is present in all diabetes types. When our levels of blood glucose surpass the kidney's capacity to reabsorb the glucose, it passes through to our urine, leading to extreme urination and intense thirst. Losing glucose chronically might cause quick weight loss and might also rouse appetites. Common symptoms of diabetes include repeated urination, boosted thirst, quick weight loss that can't be explained otherwise, boosted hunger regardless of the weight loss, exhaustion. These symptoms are witnessed in all forms of diabetes, but are mostly found in type 1 diabetes, since type 2 diabetes occur more gradually. Currently, type 2 diabetes is usually not obvious. Before, people were being diagnosed through routine testing of blood. In intense cases, type 1 diabetic patients might have diabetic ketoacidosis or alarmingly high blood acid levels owing to insulin deficiency. Its symptoms encompass abdominal pain, befuddlement, quick breathing, fruity breath, and losing consciousness. This is a critical situation and urgent insulin treatment is required. As far as severe type 2 diabetic cases are concerned, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome might appear. High blood glucose leads to a lot of urination, which may contribute to alarming dehydration, coma, seizures, and in some cases, death. Taking into account the high or normal insulin levels in type 2 diabetes, it does not lead to ketoacidosis. The Diabetes Code, Blood Test to Diagnose Diabetes Two such tests exist, hemoglobin A1c and blood glucose. The Diabetes Code, Type 1 and Type 2 Diabetes Specifics Type 1 diabetes might appear at any age, but majority of its cases are diagnosed in childhood. The cases of type 1 diabetes have been increasing in numbers globally and in the U.S. in recent history. This form of diabetes is an autoimmune disease, i.e. the body's immune systems are the culprit behind cell damage in the body, which impedes the secretion of insulin. In this case, the blood of patient encompasses antibodies to normal islet cells in humans, which proves an autoimmune attack. Insulin-generating cells get destroyed cumulatively over time, leading to severe deficiency of insulin and the appearance of symptom. Genetic factors in relation to type 1 diabetes are evident, but the actual case is not known. Possible infective triggers are also not evident. Some environmental factors may include a deficiency of vitamin D, sensitivity to cow's milk, and wheat production. Other autoimmune diseases also commonly occur with type 1 diabetes, including vitiligo and Graves' disease. Patients of this form of diabetes experience severe insulin deficiency. Effective treatment has its basis in substituting the loss of insulin in the hormones. Insulin injections do not cure the disease and complications including a reduction in life expectancy, heart disease, and others are still a risk. Type 2 diabetes usually attacked older adults earlier, but now is multiplying in children globally. Like childhood obesity, childhood type 2 diabetes has also become an epidemic. 
Almost 90 to 95 cases of diabetes globally occupy the category of type 2. It unfolds progressively over a course of several years and shifted from normal to pre-diabetes to completely type 2 diabetes. With age and obesity, the risk multiplies. While type 1 diabetes has a lack of insulin, type 2 has hyperglycemia, which stems from insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the inability of insulin to lessen blood glucose. To fight this resistance, the body multiplies secretion of insulin to sustain normal levels of blood glucose. This leads to consequences, i.e. high insulin levels. However, there are limits. When insulin secretion cannot match insulin resistance, the level of blood sugar increases, which leads to type 2 diabetes. This means that both types of diabetes are completely different, one with low levels of insulin and the other with high. Drug treatments are same for both. By understanding the difference, we can cure type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is different from any other disease, since it can harm our whole body. It spares no organ system. The complications linked with diabetes are either microvascular, small blood vessels, or macrovascular, large blood vessels. When small blood vessels get harmed, it leads to chronic kidney disease, visual issues, and nerve damage in patients with a long-term history of diabetes. These are known as microvascular diseases. When larger blood vessels are harmed, it leads to narrowing, known as atherosclerotic plaque. The rupture of the plaque causes this inflammation and blood clots that further contribute to strokes, heart attacks, and gangrene of the legs. These are macrovascular diseases. Other than vascular diseases, diabetes leads to other complications, such as infections, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, cancer, skin conditions, Alzheimer's disease, etc. The Diabetes Code, Microvascular Conditions Diabetes is the most prominent cause of retinopathy, blindness, in the U.S. It also leads to nephropathy or chronic kidney disease. This can cause weight loss, appetite loss, vomiting, and nausea. If left untreated, it can even cause coma and death. Another disease is neuropathy or diabetic nerve damage. It has several types, one of which affects the autonomic nervous system. If these nerves are impacted, it can lead to vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, bladder dysfunctions, erectile dysfunction, and orthostatic hypotension. If the nerves connected with the heart are affected, it can add to the risk of silent heart attacks and death. The Diabetes Code Macrovascular complications Macrovascular complications linked with diabetes include atherosclerosis, artery hardening. It leads to strokes, heart attacks, and peripheral vascular disease. Another category of macrovascular diseases caused by diabetes is heart disease, which causes heart attacks. These also include strokes. Further diseases in this category include peripheral vascular disease, etc., Since we have not been able to treat diabetes properly, there is a need to treat the cause of the disease rather than its symptoms. Diabetes is a blend of type 2 diabetes and obesity. In the context of the body mass index, BMI, there is a link between obesity and diabetes. Body mass index equals weight in kilograms by height in meters squared. Those with a body mass index of 25 or greater are believed to be overweight while those with a body mass index of 18.5 and 24.9 are supposed to be healthy. But females with a BMI of 23 to 23.9 have a 360% greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes than those with a BMI less than 22. This is astonishing since a BMI of 23.9 falls within the normal range of weight. By 1995, researchers came to the conclusion that only 5.0 to 7.9 kilograms of weight gain amplified type 2 diabetes risk by 90%, while an 8.0 to 10.9 kilogram weight gain boosted the risk by 270%. The glycemic index becomes extremely significant in this context. When carbohydrates are digested, they turn into glucose. The glycemic index measures the blood sugar increase after ingestion of 50 grams of foods containing carbohydrates. But different foods may have different carbohydrate quantities. The glycemic load improves this measure by multiplying the glycemic index of a food by the carbohydrate grams in a usual serving of that specific food. 
Obesity, or more specifically, abdominal obesity, is the primary cause of type 2 diabetes. The disease is linked with waist circumference. Also, contrary to popular weight loss advice, simple calorie reduction will not lead to weight loss. Further, weight loss is not knowingly controlled. The calories in, calories out theory is wrong. Hormones regulate hunger, asking our body to eat or stop. We do not eat food because it is available. We eat it because our hormones tell us to. Fat acclimation is an energy distribution issue rather than an energy excess one. To control fat accumulation and weight gain, we need to control hormonal signals received from foods instead of our total caloric intake. In simple words, obesity operates in the form of a hormonal imbalance. The hormonal issue in unneeded weight gain is surplus insulin. Therefore, type 2 diabetes is also related to insulin imbalance instead of caloric imbalance. Excessive insulin leads to gain in weight and obesity. Even though low-carb diets are quite successful, the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis is incomplete. Refined carbohydrates remain a significant cause of hyperinsulinemia, but they are not the only cause. Other important factors include insulin resistance. Insulin helps glucose enter the cells. However, at times, amidst insulin resistance, general insulin levels are not enough, and this causes glucose to gather in the bloodstream since it cannot enter the cells. In order to make up for this, the body ends up generating insulin in higher levels to overcome this resistance and pressure the blood glucose inside. It leads to the restoration of regular levels of blood glucose, but the hyperinsulinemia continues. This hyperinsulinemia contributes to weight gain in a general way. A question arises as to how insulin resistance appears initially. Insulin resistance operates in the form of a glucose surplus issue of the fatty liver that is overfilled. Since liver is the primary point for metabolism of ingested nutrients, it lies at the heart of health issues linked with surplus eating. Insulin resistance mainly stems from too much fatty liver penetration, which actually originates from surplus intake of glucose and fructose. Therefore, excess amounts of sugar leads to fatty liver, which mainly contributes to insulin resistance. Hyperinsulinemia, or insulin resistance, appears almost 13 years before type 2 diabetes. Insulin resistance expansion generates a long eventual increase in blood glucose, since the hyperinsulinemia stops a quicker increase. For more than 10 years, blood glucose remains normal. In children and adolescents, the phase might unfold quickly. Visceral fat gathers inside and around the organs. High insulin resistance stems from this form of fat. The first place where it begins amassing is the liver. Blood glucose increases quickly when the pancreatic beta cells that generate insulin cannot match multiplying insulin resistance. When this compensatory mechanism stops working, only one to two years pass prior to the diagnosis of complete type 2 diabetes. Insulin generation reaches its zenith and gradually begins decreasing with time. The progressive fall in insulin generation is known as beta cell dysfunction or pancreatic burnouts. The beta cell dysfunction leads to high blood glucose. In the first phase, fatty liver and fatty muscles contribute to a boost in insulin resistance. In the second phase, fatty pancreas leads to beta cell dysfunction. The pancreas gets congested with fat instead of getting burnt out. Hyperinsulinemia leads to fatty liver and to release the backup, the newly formed fat gets sent out of the liver to other body areas. Some of it goes to adipocytes, some to skeletal muscle. A huge portion also goes to the pancreas. Obese type 2 diabetes have surplus pancreatic fat. Two cycles play a role in type 2 diabetes. These are known as hepatic and pancreatic cycles. The first cycle to develop is hepatic. Ingestion of glucose and fructose in surplus amounts causes hyperinsulinemia, fatty liver, and eventually insulin resistance. The cycle starts. Elevated insulin resistance also kindles hyperinsulinemia, maintaining the cycle. This keeps going until it becomes worsen. Dr. Lustig stood in front of a large audience at a university and told them that sugar is harmful to them. This lecture became extremely popular because it brought forward and confirmed the suspicions that were already held by millions. Sugars are harmful. Sugar in blood comprised of glucose, as per biochemical reports, and so, the role of fructose was missed as of yet. It turned out that fructose is not consumed by the body like glucose, which is already favored by all the cells in the human body. 
Fructose is digested by the liver, and overconsumption of fructose leads to the formation of fatty liver. This consequently leads to intolerance of insulin levels. Fructose was originally gained from fruit resources and so was harmless, as it was unrefined, since fruit consumption leads to a sense of fullness for the consumer. It wasn't until the high fructose corn syrup came into the big picture that the fructose intake increased in the United States. HFSCs became popular amongst the food giants as they started pouring the liquid into their products. The problem started with the overconsumption of the products that contained the fructose concentrates. Consumers didn't feel that they were full of these sugars because there was no satisfaction with the consumption, and they kept on using these products to feel fuller. There was a reported case in the high intake of fructose from about 37 grams in 1977 to 55 grams in 1994, and by the time the millennia had started, the consumption went to about 72.8 grams per day. It is of utmost importance that one realizes that it wasn't calories that were the enemy of the perfect insulin balance in the body. It was the sugar intake that was affecting the insulin balance. Insulin balance is of special importance in controlling diabetes. Fructose never causes insulin to release in the first place, and the high amounts of fructose transform into fats, which cause fatty livers, imbalance of insulin, and increased resistance to insulin in the body. Metabolic syndrome was earlier called Syndrome X because the causal element for the syndrome was unknown. There were numbers of related issues that could be traced back to one another, but no one could pinpoint just what exactly was initiating the cycle in the first place. It later emerged that hyperinsulinemia was the root cause of this issue. There are certain characteristic features of the syndrome, and all of them are caused when insulin levels exceed the normal limits. Glucose consumption leads to the release of insulin from pancreas. The more glucose in the blood, the more insulin will be released. Insulin functions to store the energy from glucose in a number of manners. If the body can manage to make glycogen, then it will do so, but if glycogen levels are high, then the liver starts stimulating the lipogenesis cycle, fat formation. The lipogenesis cycle starts forming triglycerides, and these particles start storing themselves into the liver until a time when the storage of this fat moves to adipocytes, fat cells. Forming energy from these cells is hard. Triglycerides form VLDL when attached to proteins. VLDL helps stimulate storage into the fat cells. Fat cells react by releasing leptin to make sure that the body stops consuming food to such a high degree. However, the mechanism fails in the phase of high insulin levels. VLDL becomes minute and forms LDL. LDL is a key indicator for many heart related ailments. However, a low HDL level is present in the syndrome, and that is caused by high triglyceride levels in the blood. High glucose levels overwork the kidneys with an increase in micturition. A time comes when insulin levels start retention of water and sodium, and that leads to issues in blood pressure levels. Insulin additionally pushes for blood vessel constriction. High insulin levels hence push for all the symptoms of metabolic syndrome, and this syndrome is at the base of numerous other health problems like diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, obesity, and cancer. Type 1 diabetes is characterized by the absence of insulin, while type 2 diabetes have the insulin that is necessary for glucose absorption into the cells of the human body. They just don't necessarily absorb the glucose. Insulin is of crucial importance for the body, and type 1 diabetics are injected with commercially, pharmaceutically produced insulin to ensure that the glucose that is released into the bloodstream is actually used by the cells. Research was done on the issue of the level of remaining glucose levels after the use of glucose controlling measures. Results showed that the level of glucose should be controlled so as to ensure that the residual glucose doesn't damage the organs. Or cause a system wide crisis. However, further researches, based on the results of the mentioned glucose toxicity, showcase that the high level of insulin in the blood was even more damaging for the human body than the glucose levels. The damage was based on the method similar to the cycle mentioned for metabolic syndrome. High levels of insulin caused the body to resist the functions of insulin, and this affected normal glucose absorption. This disruption led to fat accumulation all over the body. Metformin, a drug that has no effect on the insulin level, assisted in reducing the obesity effect in diabetics and proved that more insulin insertion into the body is not the answer to end diabetes. 
insulin should be present at low levels to ensure that whatever is in the bloodstream, it would be welcomed by the body. A high level of insulin not only results in diabetes and metabolic syndrome, but also affects the body in different manners. Insulin receptors and insulin itself are implicated in the progression of atherosclerotic disease as the plaque grows with time, thanks to their presence in the plaque itself. On the other hand, a P10 mutation in some humans allows them to have a low glucose level but high susceptibility to getting cancer, and their condition is exacerbated by high insulin levels. Insulin also acts like a growth stimulator and pushes the highly willing cancer cells towards further growth in the body. The standard operating mechanism for specialized doctors change with the change in the guidelines for diagnosis. Diabetes and pre-diabetes cutoff points made suddenly. About half of the populace of the U.S. was diabetic. This can better be explained by how the whole issue arose as a push from pharmaceutical companies, which suddenly had a lot of drugs to help the diabetic consumer. American Diabetes Association and American College of Endocrinology, as well as the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, got monetary benefits as a result of promoting the use of hyperglycemic drugs. The author categorized different classified drugs under the caption of those that cause weight gain, those that don't, and those that have no effect on the weight gaining or losing potentials of the patient. For each drug prescribed, there is a different mechanism of action. The sulfonylureas push the production of insulin to increase glucose absorption, but also effectively increase insulin that causes obesity. Thiazolidine diones, on the other hand, get attached to fat cells to increase the effect of insulin on them. Glucose levels decline, but the body mass increases since insulin also stimulates weight gain. Metformin, from the neutral section of oral hypoglycemic drugs, reduces gluconeogenesis in the hepatic organ. Lessens blood glucose and consequently insulin. DPP4 inhibitors stop the flow of insulin that occurs following incretin release from a carbohydrate-full stomach. Insulin remains same and any blood glucose is absorbed. The newer SGLT2 inhibitors act in the best possible manner. They decrease the blood glucose level by pushing glucose out of the urinary route. There is no increase in insulin levels and no increase in body fat levels. A propensity for weight loss is present. Incidentally, there is no increase in the cardiovascular symptoms either. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors act within the digestive system to reduce glucose absorption. They also reduce insulin level and hence the weight of the patient. GLP-1 acts by copying the effect of incretin. Additionally, by making a person feel that he or she is full. It ensures that weight reduction occurs through reduction in the food intake. The effects of the weight-reducing drugs that act by decreasing glucose level alongside insulin levels are the most desired. However, it is the concurrent change in lifestyle that would help diabetics more than these drugs. It was in 2015 that someone finally stepped up on a podium to declare the truth of the contemporary diet plans issued by the ADA in the early 2000s. Dr. Sarah Halberg talked about the issue that was affecting everyone in the United States, i.e., the issue of the low-fat and high-carbohydrate diet. It was understood that the physician who checked all the literature on the subject thought that high-fat levels would increase cholesterol levels and hence increase the risk of hypertension, cardiovascular events, and the possibility of stroke. On the contrary, fats were not all bad, and some of them were good for the body. While the high carbohydrate diet was left unchecked, one issue behind the mentioned diseases was left unchecked. Diabetes increases the risk for cardiac events. The patients of diabetes are at a higher risk for getting myocardial infarctions by the way of plaque formation. On the other hand, a question arose as to how the high carbohydrate diet was even relevant to the diabetics, since it was bound to exacerbate the disease. Exercise was another factor that was hailed as a possible end to the diabetic dilemma, since it would stimulate increased consumption of glucose by the human body. It turned out that exercising didn't help reduce diabetes; rather, a person was just more prone to excessive consumption of sugars. The level of sugar intake increased, and weight reduction ended for an individual with the balancing act continuously taking place. However, meta-analysis shows that the level of A1C reduced with an increase in exercise, but since there was no visible reductions in weight, people couldn't see the benefits. 
the level of compliance associated with exercising is a separate issue on its own. With both solutions discussed in this chapter, the regimes fail to address the main issue that causes diabetes. It is the carbohydrate content that needs to be controlled in order for the consequent control of insulin levels. Patients who go through weight reduction surgeries have shown that their type 2 diabetes suddenly ends. This effect has been under scrutiny since this negates the age-old belief that once someone acquires type 2 diabetes, they consider to have it for the rest of their lives. The author explained different surgeries that have been used for the very purpose of reducing body mass. The surgeries act on a digestive system since hormonal control is actually allotted to the stomach, while absorption of the nutrients takes place in the intestines. As early as 1925, it was learned that the reduction of diseased portions of stomach, as in peptic ulcer, leads to weight reduction as well, as a diabetes halts until some parts grow back. Jejunu colic bypass surgery took place in 1963 and started the race for surgeries that can reduce weight. The stomach to colon transfer of food left a lot to be desired, certainly the crucial nutrients. The surgery turned up again in the form of jejunoileal bypass. Even if absorption did take place, there was still the issue of complications. Contemporary surgeries have a more sophisticated approach to reduction of different parts of the digestive system. Rue and Y manipulated and reduced both the small intestine and the stomach. Sleeve gastrectomy took out a chunk of the stomach from inside the healthy patient. The gastric lap band, on the other hand, simply placed a band outside the stomach structure and reduced the space within the stomach. All of the contemporary surgeries led up to the end of type 2 diabetes within a period of months, and there was also an associated decline in the weight. Soon, everyone was trying to understand why these particular effects took place. Was it the hormone or was it something else? Ultimately, it came down to the basics. The body started using the stored glycogen to make energy and ultimately started using fat from fat cells when there was not enough food to sustain the body. Diabetes became evident with the turn of century and even children as young as three years were susceptible to the disease. The culprit turned out to be none other than the high-carbohydrate diet. Some people didn't accept the fate that awaited them with diabetes controlling drugs, but instead, they started controlling their diets. The low-carbohydrate diet turned out to be quite effective for these chosen few. An individual even benefited from the likes of the ketogenic diet. This makes sense since carbohydrates are the real culprit, and this negates the already famous carbohydrate-rich diet as the best diet to follow for Americans and people all over the world. Unrefined carbohydrates have kept up as a relatively harmless diet, as evidenced in the people who have been utilizing lifestyles, where the diet consists of about 80% carbohydrates, but in an unrefined form. The refined form of carbohydrates is very easy to absorb and hence is harmful to the body, as it starts the vicious insulin cycle that leads to hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. Unrefined carbohydrates are harder to absorb, since the body has to first process the added proteins and fats along with fibrous food stuff. The recent American Diabetes Association guidelines were vague in the sense that they failed to address the issue of nutrients other than carbohydrates, one that had previously allowed an excess of what is absolutely needed by the body. The consumption of carbohydrates should be limited for the harms that it brings upon the body. There are other nutrients too, and so it is best to turn to them. Fructose is dangerous in both its unrefined and refined forms, since it is directly involved in the insulin resistance issue. Fructose amounts should be limited, even when it is consumed in the form of fruits or vegetables. One should be wary of one's diet. On the other hand, consuming fats is beneficial, contrary to what has always been believed by the vast majority. One should try to consume as much of saturated fat as possible, especially in times when fighting off diabetes is the main concern. There are two ways of going about life when one is diagnosed with diabetes. One can either try to cure the disease or fixate on drugs and diets that do nothing for one other than just prolonging the disease. Bariatric surgery helps in reversing the condition for diabetics and the obese because it enforces involuntary fasting upon the patient. It reduces the caloric intake up to zero, and that is something that one should strive to do if one wants to better control insulin levels. A program named The Biggest Loser 
pits obese people against one another, and they fixate on the reduction of calorie intake along with exercising. However, this calorie reduction doesn't sustain for long, as people need energy and caloric reduction just makes them weaker, with their metabolism lowering over time. The basal metabolism level rises back to normal after the diet ends for these people. For the sake of ending diabetes, it is necessary that basal metabolism remain constant before and after the diet, so that the individual will not go back to his previous diet. There is reportedly proof of more benefits from fasting than from a low-carbohydrate and high-fat diet. Intermittent fasting is beneficial since the level of carbohydrate intake is absent for the chosen time. This makes the body go to its stored sources of glycogen and fat. The body starts generating energy from these sources and as a result, pockets of insulin increasing substances decrease. Insulin levels also decline with the absence of glucose that stimulates it to release. With intermittent fasting, people have a decline in the rate of insulin that is released, as well as in the resistance to insulin over time. The body reverts back to its original level of insulin release and at the same time accepts what little insulin is released for the sake of glucose absorption. Fat stores all over the body start reducing. One should, however, be cautious in their approach since the level of glucose in the body fluctuates if one is taking drugs. People should ensure that they have their physician's approval. Similarly, if an individual starts feeling unsure about fasting, they should talk to their physician. Water intake should remain constant throughout the fast to ensure hydration of the body. Ultimately, diabetes is curable. If only one is willing to accept what is needed to be done for diabetes reversal to take place. Metabolic syndrome and obesity are just as curable by the fasting regime as diabetes.